Hey guys, back at the playground again, huh? Yep. You know what this playground could use? A wine country. Heck yeah! And some waves, so we could go surfing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love that! A redwood forest would be cool. I'm in! Ah, ski slopes. Let's do it! Um, can a girl go shopping? Yeah, baby! Wait! Did we just invent California? Discover why California is the ultimate playground at visitcalifornia.com. Get in zone, AutoZone. Welcome to AutoZone. What are you working on today? Ah, thinking about gas mileage. You know, changing your oil with a full synthetic oil like Castrol Edge can help your engine get more miles. Right now, you can get five quarts with an STP Extended Life oil filter for only $36.99. Get started on your next job today with the parts you need when you need them at AutoZone or AutoZone.com. Get in zone, AutoZone. Restrictions apply. It's time for a Big Blue Kickoff Live. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it because you did. On Giants.com. You know what I saw? New York Giant Prime. And the Giants mobile app. 17-14 is the final. One touchdown, we are world champions. Believe it, and it will happen. Part of the Giants Podcast Network. Let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. Have some fun. Hello, everybody. Happy Wednesday and welcome to another edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football giants. I am John Schmelk, and you recognize the man to my left. A special appearance, the voice of the giants, Bob Papa, joining us for our special draft preview of Big Blue Kickoff Live. Bob Papa, how are you? John, I'm sifting through a lot of rumors right now, trying to figure out what's going to happen with the giants with the sixth overall pick. I was with Joe Shane this morning. And he told you everything. And he told me nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's 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 what it's going on with all thirty two teams right now. They're the teams are making calls, they're fielding calls, they're reaching out uh for potential scenarios. Because other than the Chicago Bears picking number one overall and Caleb Williams, nobody knows who for sure Washington's gonna take. It looks like it's Jaden Daniels, and then the mystery begins at number three. So Teams are trying to put deals in place. If my guy is available, would you willing to be trade with me? And that's what's going on around the league. Yeah, I'm with you, and I think the questions really do start at number three. Uh, Dane Brugler put out a tweet last night. Obviously, friend of the program, does a great job covering the draft. He said a lot of chatter that uh, the Patriots might favor J.J. McCarthy over Drake May at three. Tony Pauline, we just recorded our final mock draft for draft season today. He said he's 50-50 whether or not. He had the Patriots linked to McCarthy more than a month ago. So he's 50-50 McCarthy May to the Patriots at three. And then at four and five, which one or if any of those two teams trade up could dictate who's available when the Giants pick at number six? Yeah, I mean, is Minnesota going to make a move? Is Denver going to make a move? I'm not sure the Raiders would make a move only because I think they have enough to kind of hold the fort and unless the draft falls in a way that they want to. Uh, with the Gardner Minshew acquisition. I think they feel covered at quarterback right now. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see what those other teams do. And again, you know, what player is available and what the team really likes is going to dictate a lot of that. Yeah, at this point, I'd be shocked if the Broncos and Vikings do not select quarterbacks in the first round. But when do they select those quarterbacks in the first round? I could just as easily see the Broncos move back, select Bo Nix somewhere in the 20s, as they might trade up. So that's really what we're trying to figure out I don't out know here. if Bo Nix is going to be there in the 20s. No, he might not be. You're right. Um, you know, doing my show on Sirius NFL Radio with uh, four-time Super Bowl champion coach Charlie Weiss, Bo Nix is his second favorite player in this draft. Really? As far as quarterbacks are concerned. Jaden Daniels is his first. He's correct? been all over Jaden Daniels since the fall before he even won the Heisman. As far as the way he looks at him is – and, and thinks about the pro game. And then uh, Bo Nix is the other guy. He loves Bo Nix. He spent time with Bo Nix at the Combine, and he says it's like sitting next to Tom Brady. And that's yeah. a guy that literally sat next to Tom Brady. Correct. He said his football IQ, his everything about him, the fact that he was able to carry his team, and I could see a Bo Nix being like a perfect fit for Sean Payton and the Denver Broncos. Yeah, they might just decide we'll stick and pick here and we can't, you know. Well, really, they may move up and go get him. When it comes to quarterbacks, you can't get cute, right? If you need a guy, you got to get your guy one way or the other. Well, if you're those teams in the early teens, I mean, if, if you see that player still on the board, 
I, isn't the smart move to pick up the phone and talk to the Chicago Bears because the Bears at this point are in a situation where they don't have any glaring needs. And sitting at number nine, they could easily trade back uh, to where Denver is or where Minnesota is and still get a guy who's got a top 10 grade. Yeah, I'd say the Falcons at eight too, right? They, they think People think they're going to be the first team to pick a defensive player. And there doesn't seem to be a great consensus of what the best, who the best defensive player is, right? Is it Dallas Turner? Is it Quinion Mitchell? Is it Byron Murphy? Is it Leatu Latu? So they might be comfortable. All right, we'll just pick the best defensive player at 12 or 13, and we'll get out of eight. So there are other ways teams can move up instead of moving into the top five. Yeah, it's, it's shaping up to be a fascinating draft this year, for sure. I mean, I, I'm all fired up, and I, I, I'm really anxious to see what happens with the Giants. But really, again, people keep asking about, well, what are the Giants? I was in Dallas this past weekend, a lot of Giants fans in Dallas, and they kept asking me, what do you, what do you think the Giants are going to do? I said, I don't know what three, four, and five are going to do at this point. So how can I tell you what number six is going to do? Generally speaking, the three position groups that could be available with that type of value at six are the quarterbacks. We talked about them. You have the wide receivers with the top three guys that seem to be the consensus top three in Odunze, Neighbors, and Marvin Harrison Jr. in no particular order. And then the offensive tackle that seems to be in that mix is Joe Alt at a Notre Dame. How would you rank, whether it's by need, Bob, or preference, or value, whether or not the Giants would go in any one of those three directions? Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if they went in any of those three directions. Um, you know, obviously, Daniel Jones uh, is going to be here this year for sure. And I think, you know, the biggest concern that you have about Daniel Jones, and I know there's a, a whole segment of the Giant fan fandom out there that can't wait to see the guy go, but, you know, it's the next situation. He's had two neck injuries in three years. That's got to be a concern. It's amazing where modern medicine has come that we're not even concerned about the ACL. So he'll be back in camp. He's fine. Yeah, it's like it's it's no big deal. (laughs) Um, They could still use help on the offensive line. And obviously, look, I've said this to you. I've said this a million times before. And me too. How many games did the Giants in the last couple of years, how many games did the Giants play where the other team would be willing to trade one of their two top receivers for a giant receiver? And the answer is none, other than when they played the Patriots last year. Throw in the fact that from last year's offense to this year's offense, you've already lost your most skilled offensive skill position player in Saquon Barkley this offseason. Devin Singletary is, is a nice player, but he's not a guy that teams will game plan against like they do for Barkley. Darren Waller's future is still up in the air. We don't know if he's going to be here. Heading into last year, we considered him the Giants' best weapon through the pass game. So you could theoretically be down your top two weapons last year you haven't brought in a Pro Bowl-level player there. And, Bob, when you look around the league, if you don't have a guy in your offense that the other team has to game plan against, it makes life on the opposing defense so much easier. Absolutely. I mean, that it's a passing league. Um, that is priority number one. And you have to be able to attack down the field. I mean, I think the Giants have a nice collection of receivers that would complement a go-to guy. But they don't have a guy that the other team is like, oh, man, how are we going to deal with this guy this week? And that's – you can't win in the NFL without him at this point. No, it becomes very, very, very difficult. All right, folks, let's open up the phones. Unless you have any other comments you want to make before we get to the call. No, Bob? I'm fired up. I'm fired up to uh, have a chance to speak with the fans and see what they're thinking right now. And I know Giants fans are all fired up. But uh, let's go. All right, let's do it. 201-939-4513. We are going to have Charlie Campbell. He usually joins us this time of year. He does all the draft stuff for Walter Football. He'll kind of give us his latest intel that he's hearing about what might happen uh, on Thursday night with the NFL draft. There'll be a quick spot around 5, 10 minutes around 1 o'clock. So we'll talk to Charlie. But otherwise, it's us, it's you, it's the phones. We'll try to get through as many calls as we can. Let's start off with Taylor down in Georgia. Taylor, you're on Big Blue Kickoff Live with Schmelk and Papa. What's up, Taylor? Hey, guys. First off, thank you so much. I love you guys. Listen to you guys every day after work. Um, thank you. Really, really quick, though. Um, so, first off, I love Neighbors. I listen to you guys, especially draft season. He's just my number one guy at six. Um, but I do see why quarterback is so important. Um, so, in that case, one, does Joe Shane ever, do they just ask um, the Patriots at three, hey, this is our guy, what is, what, is, what is it that we need to do to get this guy? Or, honestly, I feel like the Cardinals at some point are just going to have to pick the best player. 
So therefore, I don't see why they don't go Harrison. At that point, if May's gone, do you just trade the one spot with the Chargers to pick up the other quarterback? And I'll take it off the air. Well, Taylor, I think when it comes down to the quarterback, it's your evaluation of that specific player, right? Sure. You, you don't just say, all right, well, we got to trade up and get the quarterback. Who's the quarterback and what's your evaluation of that player? Because the odds are, Bob, that they see and Well, let's push Caleb Williams out of the picture because we figure he's going to be gone. We don't know how the Giants view Jaden Daniels versus Drake May versus J.J. McCarthy versus Bo Nix and Michael Penix, for all we know. We don't know how they have those guys stacked and which of that group they believe can be an elite NFL quarterback. And without knowing that, it's impossible to know what that offer would be if there would be an offer to move up. It depends who's there. Well, it's interesting because, uh, again, I'll refer to Charlie Weiss. Um, you know, and, and he said, I, I, there's one thing I can guarantee you. Outside of about 12 to 15 players, there is not a single draft board of the 32 teams in the NFL that looks even remotely the same. And you, he says when you get down to the nitty-gritty of this stuff, there's no way that you have guys even. You, you, there's a guy that you really love, and then there's other guys that you like, and you don't take a quarterback that you just like that high in a draft. It better be a guy that you have full conviction in that you believe is a guy that's going to lead your team and eventually – get handed the Lombardi trophy. You don't take the guy you like because the guy you love already went off the board. You figure out plan B. And then tell the way this works is that Joe Shane will have had conversations with all of the general managers in front of him and below him. So if they come to a point where you want to make a trade, they'll have basic parameters in place oh, yeah. where it's they can start that conversation. Now they might've called the Patriots last week and they said, all right, well, New England, we'd be willing to offer X, Y, and Z. And the Patriots are like, well, that's not enough. And the John's like, okay, and they know they might not be able to get that deal done. But they'll have an idea of the neighborhood you're going to be in to move up or even what you could get if you slide back to all these different spots. But Monty Ossenford, for example, the general manager of the Cardinals, Bob, said just a couple days ago, I'm purposely waiting until I'm on the clock because I know that's when the opposing GM is going to start sweating a little bit. They'll be like, well, I really got to have this guy. So he thinks he might be able to get an even bigger premium on a trade. Sure, absolutely. When, when, when he gets on the clock. Yeah, I mean, and... Again, and, and Joe Shane talked about this this morning at this um, at this breakfast that we were at. But, you know, you start making calls today and you've been making calls last week and then you start refining calls and then, you know, the draft doesn't start until tomorrow night and you're starting to say, hey, here's what I'm willing to give you if a player that we want is available or vice versa in trading back. If a team approaches you and there's a player that they really want, yeah, I'll work a deal with you if he's available. So it becomes contingent upon availability. It becomes contingent upon price. And then that 10-minute pressure point, which goes, you know, the same thing happens with the start of round two and three. Because, again, yeah. that starts in the evening. Now you've assessed what's happened on night one and what you've done in free agency and everything else. And now you start saying, okay, here are some guys that are on the board. We got eight guys with a first round grade on them. You got time to sleep on it. You start thinking. You start thinking about what kind of deal you're going to make. And then they have all day on Friday until the draft starts to start burning the phone lines again. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that, that that's certainly something that could happen as you move forward here. Um, and that's why teams like to have those picks right at the top of rounds two and round four, because that's the overnight. When guys like you know, Jim can get locked in on one guy and be like, "I gotta have this." Yeah, guy. and, and, and you also get value. You, and, and as he mentioned, you know, you get back together with your staff, you go through reevaluations as far as okay, here's where we're at. Again, how did we like this guy? Let's do a little bit more discussion on him, and okay, let's pull the trigger and make a call and make a deal. All right, two zero one nine three nine four five one three. James in Georgia is up next. Hey, James. Hey, what's going on, guys? What's up? Um, yesterday's show, uh, yeah, it was a great show. Thank you. Um, y'all doing a good job on all the coverage. Yesterday's show was just kind of up my alley too with the off the wall hypotheticals and the trade scenarios. So, so, um, so James, real quick, Bob, what I did yesterday with, with, with Howard and Lance, just so you're aware of what he's talking about. I basically went through the trade chart and I came up with like six or seven different hypothetical move ups or downs based on the value and Lance and Howard kind of gave their yeses or no on the whole thing. Okay. 
I got you. That's yeah. that's fun. The old Gil Brandt points chart. Yeah, exactly. Correct. Go ahead, James. So based on that, um, uh, kind of uh, lost. I was going to say on the first part, but here's what I called to say um, with the copycat league that it is. Um, I think our team is closer to having what our version of Knicks, Cruz, and Manningham was on our team. Um, can you, since we're looking for an extra receiver, is there um, a comp uh, of uh, Akeem Knicks out there who, you know, not a burner, but has great route running, good hands, catches with his hands, uh, you know, that type of situation. Of this um, group at the top you're talking about, specifically, James, I would say Roma Dunze is probably mm-hmm. the guy where he doesn't look super fast, but he gets separation, mm-hmm. has really good hands, makes contested catches, is tough as nails, plays through contact. That, I think, Bob, that for me, mm-hmm. in terms of play style, would probably be the comp. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting that uh, he brought up this comparison because uh, at this breakfast this morning, Akeem Nix was there, and he's actually in the building here today, yep. along with Ahmad Bradshaw and Prince Amukumar and several other guys. Um, yeah, I think Adunze is the guy that would kind of fit that mold. Um, but I'm not, I'm not 100% certain, with all due respect, that the Giants are one receiver away from having Nick's Manningham and Cruz. Yeah, I'm not sure Wando Robinson's Victor Cruz yet, and I'm not sure Jalen right. Hyatt is Mario right. Manningham yet either, for that matter. Right. Mm, uh, I, oh, I remember my uh, thing yesterday. You didn't bring up, um, John, um, the situation that's kind of floating with Patrick Sertan and 12 being in the mix uh, from Denver. Yeah, yeah, because, uh, James, because, okay. because, look, Denver doesn't have the draft capital to move up because they don't have their second-round pick, so if they're going to want to compete with one of these other teams, it's going to have to be a player, and we've seen that happen before. Yeah, yeah, the, the, so I guess yesterday, so you didn't bring up the scenario that, like, I guess is kind of out there from the coach and the GM that Patrick Sertan, uh, 12, and I think next year's, like, they're willing to give up next year's 1-2, to move up, would you do that to go back to twelve with the ten included? And I think it, I think they added in like next year's one. Well, James, I don't think that would be the move to six. I think that would be the move to three. I don't think they would have to give up a one and Sir Tan to go to six if you go by the points chart per se. From six to from six to twelve, that, that that's not uh, I mean, adding Sir Tan, and there would be too much, or you don't need to give up the extra one. They wouldn't have to give up the extra one. I think it would be one or the other. I don't think you would get both in that move. Yeah. You get the flop of the first and you get Sertan. You're not getting another draft pick. Correct. Um, cool. <laughs> Last one, I don't go. Is there, is there a comp out there that can that complete our pass rush um, as far as, you know, trying to get O.C., Tuck, and J.P.P. Pack back together. And I'll take it off the air. Thank you, guys. I love the comps, James. You're always yeah. trying to recreate the past here. I like it. So I guess what, that Brian Burns is O.C.? I guess you would make it, right? I don't know. I, <laughs> Brian Burns is um, he's really talented, and he does get a lot of sacks without actually having to hit the quarterback because he gets the ball out. Who knows what's going to happen with um, Aziz Ojolari? Right? I mean, he's under contract. He's got another year. Let's see if he could stay healthy and and be more productive. Um, Yeah, I could see an edge guy on day two, but I wouldn't consider that a top-line need for this team. No, absolutely not. You kind of roll the dice with Ojolari, and then worst-case scenario is you look on the uh, August free agent market for some veteran guy who's got the knack to rush the passer. But, I mean, look, receiver, corner, safety – reinforce O-line. There's a lot of other areas. Wide receiver. Defensive tackle. Maybe. Tight end. Yeah. I mean, tight end is something you have to – I mean, and again, Coach Weiss talked about he loves some of the tight ends in this draft and, uh, you know, as later picks. Browers obviously being the standalone guy as far as a first-round pick. But when a guy is contemplating retirement, the old Parcells line – once they start thinking about retiring, they're kind of on their way to retirement. So that, that's an area that the Giants are going to have to address in this draft as well because the tight ends that they brought in, 
uh, I, I think I, I added it up one day. I think the combined amount of career catches is like 32 <laughs> between all the guys. So, and, and not like Daniel Bellinger can't be a weapon in the past game, but this game in today's NFL calls for a more athletic, down the field threat, pass catching tight end. Yeah. And if you look at all the good teams, they have one. No, I, I agree. And I don't think, you know, Lance has called that a luxury pick at tight end with what they have here on the roster, I'm not there. Uh, I think, and that's why I think if the Giants get a great offer to move down and you're picking there at, let's say, nine or something like that, Bowers would be in the conversation for me. I think he's, I know Charlie Weiss loves Bowers as a player too. He is, he's special. He's very good. Yeah, I mean, if you move back, um, you could take Bowers or maybe Adunze is still there or whatever right. the case is. Or you, moving back, gets you maybe a second round pick another second round pick and you can certainly get a frontline receiver there too correct guys go subscribe to the giant subtle podcast that's brought to you by citizens the official bank of the giants we've had a lot of great episodes this week brandon thorne on the o-line Derek classen on the wide receivers Rhett lewis from nfl network just went up there as well and just over the past month or so talking draft uh guys like bucky books bucky brooks part of me field yates uh charles davis uh former giants quarterback kurt warner hall of famer uh former general managers randy mueller uh uh, Thomas Dimitrov. So just go back. A lot of great episodes. Nate Tice from The Athletic was fantastic when we had him. So go back. Check out all those episodes uh, on the Giants Huddle podcast on the Giants app, Giants.com slash podcast, which is search for Giants Huddle on your favorite podcast platform. And if you're an Apple podcast, don't forget to leave us a five-star positive review for any and all of our podcasts, including Big Blue Kickoff Live. It certainly helps. Same deal with draft season, by the way. Our last two episodes are, are going up. Uh, the mock draft will be up by the end of Wednesday. We have Tony's latest intel from Monday's show. Again, you can find draft season the same places you can find the Giants Huddle podcast. All right, let's go to the calls. Let's go to Dave in Michigan. He's up next. Hi, Dave. Hey, how you doing, guys? Bob, Good. it's great to talk to you. Um, you'll know who this is if I say WFUV 90.7. <laughs> well, yeah, the Fordham University. How you doing, man? Good. How are you? Good, good. I love talking to to, to uh, Paul as well sometimes. So. Anyway, on the draft, you know, I, I've been looking at all the video I can find on uh, Dunze, and he looks good. But I can't get away from, from this fact. We have a reconstituted offensive line. This line is going to take half a season to gel. And if it's going to be a much better offensive line, um, it's going to take that long. We have at best what I would describe as an iffy quarterback room. That tells me that there's going to be an emphasis and a premium and importance on passes ranging from, you know, 8 to 25 yards, not vertical passes going down 50, 60 yards. That keeps leading me to Bowers. Whether we trade back or we trade at six, this and I, Howard Cross, uh, you know, said this guy is is like, but this guy would be like drafting Bavaro. Now he's a little shorter than Bavaro, but who cares about an inch and a half or two inches? This guy, to me, is the Christian McCaffrey of tight ends. Um, he's an offensive weapon. Never mind positional value about tight end. And I have no faith that Waller is going to be a factor uh, in, in the next year, whether he can stay on the field or not. So I'm just, I'm all in on Bowers at six or nine or 10. If that's, you know, if there's, and I'm all for trading back a few, you know, to get more picks. So Dave, I have a I question for you, real quick. Um, how about Malik Neighbors, who also is very adept at catching some short passes and then turning those into big plays? I think he's a guy you can get the ball to pretty quickly as well. I, I this is gut, okay? It's absolute gut. I feel like Bowers is going to be a more robust, durable player than 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 Neighbors and. And the thing that scares me off of that neighbors and Odunze, honestly, is 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 Galladay is the Galladay experience. You know, oh, hold, I, on, I hold, hold, Odunze, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. The Galladay experience was a grave miscalculation of hoping that a player was going to come back from an injury and regain form of years gone by. 
Um, we're talking about. I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not following the Galladay thing. Well, I wasn't aware that the biggest reason Galladay busted on him was was the recurrence of of that I- injury. Yeah, he couldn't run. In fact, it's I, hard to play receiver if you can't run. Yeah, Dave, it wasn't that the injury came back. It just sucked some of the athleticism out of him, and he lost that edge as an athlete that allowed him to be the receiver that he used to be. Well, I okay. I mean, I trust you guys, but you know, my, I didn't realize because he looked fine to me. I just couldn't figure out. And I know P. Dot said it was a mystery, you know, as to why he just disappeared. Um, he lo- know, he coaching- listen. You always, you always hear this in in any sport. He lost a step. And sometimes, mm-hmm. like in the boxing world, sometimes guys get old in one fight. And Galladay was robbed of his ability to get off the line, and all it takes is that fraction of a second to be slower, and you're toast. Yeah, and sometimes for a player, that might make them a little bit worse, right? And instead of being a pro bowler, they're just an average starter. Other guys, you lose a little bit, and it just takes everything away. You don't have much left, and unfortunately, that's what happened to Galladay. Well, my bottom line, I'm all in on Bowers. I love Bowers. I think he's... I, I think he's a mix. Of, I, I think he's like Shockey and McCaff, you know, like a combo of Shockey and McCaffrey, you know. I mean, I just I just can't quite get there with Odunze, but if they think Odunze is a better bet pound for pound, inch for inch, I listen, one thing I will tell you, I trust Shane and Dayball to make a solid decision. Um, I did not trust the previous regime for that. So. Thank you, Dave. Well, I mean, listen, John. I I don't know about you. I'm not. I mean, if 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 neighbors is on the board at six and Bowers, I mean, I would rather personally. I think I'd like to see them take neighbors. I think the wide receiver in the modern NFL is the more valuable position. You gain more on the cap end of it, right? In terms of how much you gain in cap space by having a wide receiver on a rookie deal. And as good as Bowers is, he doesn't have that neighbor's ability to catch it five and run it for 70. Bowers might catch it for five and run it for 15, but he's not going to run it for 70 like like neighbors can. Yeah, and the Giants need explosives. They need the explosive plays. I mean, they had some explosives last year with Jalen Hyatt, but too many times whoever was in a quarterback was running for their life or on the ground, and it didn't matter how open he was downfield. It was a sack or it was a check down because there was no protection. So hopefully this revamped offensive line uh, will give Daniel Jones time to at least hit some of these targets. And they shouldn't ever get to a point with the O-line this year, either, Bob, where they were last year when they have to bring Justin Pugh off the street to start. They've thrown so many numbers at this group now between Jermaine Illuminor, John Runyon Jr. Uh, They bring in Aaron Stinney, who started a lot of games for Tampa last year. Austin Schlotman started a lot of games for the Vikings. Plus, you hope Josh Azudu is healthy again. You hope uh, McKeithen's healthy again. And that's not even including the four other starters. You're talking 11 guys right there that you should feel okay about if you have to putting them to the starting lineup. So, you didn't even mention Evan Neal. No, yeah, again, <laughs> okay. you're doing my Neal, Thomas, Schmitz, obviously, would, would be the other three guys, and, and then Runyon. Yeah, so, I mean, they definitely have more pieces to the puzzle. Now they have to figure out what pieces belong where in the puzzle. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's go to Joe in South Plainfield, and we'll have Charlie Campbell on in a couple of minutes. Joe, what's going on? Hi, thank you so much for taking my call, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks for calling. Uh do you see a scenario where the Giants just uh, stick and pick at six? They'll get whether it's their neighbors or Dunze, and if a quarterback even remotely starts to fall, uh, they can trade back in from the second round into the first, the middle of the first. And what would that cost to give up? And is that something you think they'd even be willing to do to give up that many assets? How far up are you looking to trade into the first round? Well, conceivably, you would have to get around 15 to 20. It, 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 even if quarterback even makes it down that far. Yeah, the they, I'm hearing they're, they're, they're not. Top 15. I, I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't. The only possibility, I think, is could Panix be there at the start of day two? With, with the injuries, maybe. The injuries were a while ago, too. Yep. I mean, if you want to move up that far, right, the Giants pick at 47 in the second round. I'll just throw out, let's say the, you say middle of the first. So let's say Seattle at 16. 
That's a thousand points for that pick. The Giants are at four thirty, so you got to make up five hundred and seventy picks. That would cost probably your first round pick next year to move up a full round, in my opinion. Yeah, I just I, if a quarterback falls that they love, obviously you have to take them. But to miss out on one of these big three receivers, to me, I don't know. Between neighbors, the Dunze, and possibly Marvin Harrison Jr. on those type of generational talents, yeah, they're good players. Be, uh, I know trading back to get Brock Bowers would be good, but oh man, that that'd be too hard to pass up in my opinion. Yeah, and again, um, you know, nobody forced the Giants to sign Daniel Jones. I mean, True. they signed him because after one year of having him in the program and the head coach getting an opportunity to work with the player and the evaluation of the player, they were comfortable enough to give him this deal that they gave him at $40 million a year. Like, they could have easily just said, hey, Daniel Jones did a great job for us this year, but we don't see him as our long-term future. We're going to, once we couldn't franchise him, and we had to use the franchise tag on Saquon. We're going to let him hit free agency. We got Tyrod here who knows what we're doing offensively, and then in 2024 when the draft comes, we'll make a move to go get a franchise quarterback. They had that option. Nobody forced them to keep – they kept Daniel Jones because they believe that there is a future for him within what they're doing. So I don't know if there's this – Would there would be this urge then to give up next year's number one pick – to move up to 15 or 16 or 14 or 13 to go get a quarterback. Well, if that's the case, now it's time to surround him with elite talent, which he could very well succeed with. Let's hope so. <laughs> yeah, no, no, Joe, absolutely, and appreciate the call, man. And I would just say that, you know, to the call's previous point, I think it was the previous caller, you have Brian Daly your head coach here, Bob. There's no one, and he's coached almost every position on the offensive side and a lot well, on the defensive side too. I trust him and Joe Shane together to know which offensive players are going to be effective and be effective quickly in what he wants to run on offense. Yeah, exactly. And if, for whatever reason, it doesn't work out, then you got next year's draft and you go back at it. Yeah, you figure it out. All right, now let's uh, say hello to Charlie Campbell. He, of course, covers the draft uh, for Walter Football. Charlie, I appreciate the time. You got John Schmilk and Bob Poppy. You join us this week, every year, giving us your latest intel on the NFL draft. Charlie, thanks for being with us, man. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back with you guys. All right, Charlie, let, 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 let's roll it out real quick. From what you're hearing, we'll start with the top three. What do you think the top three picks in this draft are going to look like? I think it's going to be Caleb Williams to the Bears, Jaden Daniels to Washington, and Drake May to the Patriots. Any chance the Patriots move, try to trade out of that, or will it have to be some kind of godfather offer that will never show up? Yeah, I think it's that's the only way. Um, but I, I think they they're putting it out there just to see, you know, what somebody might offer who's super desperate. But I don't think when push comes to shove, they're going to move out of that pick. Yeah, I mean, not to mention that in a lot of ways, Charlie, they're desperate. Jacoby Brissett is a hold-the-fort guy, but in order exactly. to kick – in order to and he, and he would be a great guy to have to start the first part of the season. He's a great teammate. He's got a high football IQ. Mentor, bring along a guy, and if you know the guy struggles or the guy gets hurt, you could always put – you know, can always put him back in and you know win a couple games, hold the fort, but they need a quarterback too, and they're hoping to never be in this position again at number three. It's fi- I find it hard to believe that the Patriots would pass on one of these quarterbacks unless there's something about one of these guys that just has completely turned them off. Yeah, I completely agree, and I, I think that it's just uh, you know a lot of the pre-draft kind of smoke screens and whatnot but I mean they as you know as their owner said Robert Kraft said this offseason that they you know they want a young quarterback they want stability at the position they want a young franchise guy to build around Um, so I think that that's really the direction they're going I would be shocked if they actually did that and traded out and passed on one of the top three quarterbacks now I think it's a different conversation at four and five though right Charlie what what are you hearing about what Arizona's thinking at four and what the Chargers are thinking at five in terms of trading out or if they do stick and pick what direction they might go because I'm hearing late the Chargers might end up going wide receiver and on offensive tackle 
Yeah, I I heard that Arizona is waiting till they're on the clock to make a trade. They're trying to maximize the value for that and try and see, you know, if that increases what the package that they would be getting. And I've heard that uh, Minnesota is trying to move up to four. They could potentially kind of have the parameters in place now, uh, and then they'll just wait till they're on the clock. But um, but I do think that that's the prime spot to have a trade happen. Uh, and I've and Chargers are a big mystery. They're keeping things really tight within that building, and it's a new general manager. So I think a lot of the uh, holdover staff is being very cautious with what they're saying, and uh, because of that, the whole lot's really leaking out. But I think. Given their actions and what they have on the team, if I had to bet, I would bet on them taking Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors. Oh, so you think the Chargers will go wide receiver, huh? I think so, because uh, Trey Pipkins, their right tackle, is not a bad player. I know people have kind of pushed the, the Harbaugh offensive line um, and obviously that's something that's been a huge part of his teams, uh, but they have a good left tackle in Rashawn Slater. Trey Pipkins uh, is, is a solid right tackle. He's not paid a whole lot of money, um, so you, you're saving money by having a cheap right tackle there. So I don't think they are feeling the real urge to – to uh, do a big replacement there. And when they have Keenan Allen now in Chicago, trading him away and cutting Mike Williams, uh, that's a big, big loss in the playmaking and mismatch issues and receiving talent for Justin Herbert. So I think that's a big problem that they're going to need to address. You already mentioned Minnesota trying to trade up, maybe already having the parameters of deal in place, Charlie. What are you hearing about, what the Broncos are thinking. Are they going to be going hard to move up as well? Are they just looking to stick and pick a quarterback there, maybe slide down? And then basically same set of questions for the Raiders. Those, those, are, the, those are the other two teams with pretty big quarterback needs. Well, I, you know, it's, it's a mystery, but from what I'm hearing, the Broncos are more likely to trade down at this point rather than trade up. Uh, I think just given – the, I do think they like J.J. McCarthy. I think that would be the quarterback that they would potentially move up for, but I don't think they have the desire to give up the farm, which is what it would take to move up uh, you know, from 12 to 4. I mean, you're going to look at giving up potentially multiple future first-round picks uh, and or Patrick Sertain. And I don't think they want to give all that up, especially after having given up two first-round picks for Russell Wilson, one first-round pick for Sean Payton. You'd be looking at only having one first-round pick come on your roster in a span of like five or six years. And while the Rams did that, that's really the, the exception, not the norm. NFL teams don't like to have that kind of uh, track record. So I don't think they have the stomach to do it. I think they're more likely to move back. I think – the Raiders are really interesting. They could stick and pick in terms of taking Michael Penix Jr. at 13, but I've also heard stuff that they uh, would take another position player, kind of address one of the issues on their team, and then potentially trade up from that second-round pick to get Penix maybe late in the first. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the acquisition of Gardner Minshew uh, gives the Raiders a little bit of flexibility as far as not having to rush or jump into anything and seeing how the draft unfolds uh, because they got two guys there that I think they have, you know, obviously they got some confidence in. Do you do you expect all six of these quarterbacks to go in round one? Uh, I think we'll have five go in the first round. I don't think we're going to have a sixth. I think that most likely Bo Nix, uh, slides to day two. Interesting. Any other teams, before we get your prediction on the Giants, Charlie, that you think are, are sleepers to move up? I know we've heard late that maybe the Eagles might try to navigate their way up in this draft and maybe try to draft a cornerback. Uh, any other teams you think are, are really looking to move up or down uh, that we haven't really heard much about? 
Well, I think the Bears and the Jets would like to move down at 9 and 10 because both of them are without a second-round pick. The Bears don't have many draft picks at all after uh, their two in the top 10. So I do think both of those teams would prefer to move down so they have more uh, ability to add stock players on their roster with backup to starter potential uh, from day two picks. So I do think those two would like to move down for sure. Then I've heard some rumblings about the Colts and Jaguars potentially moving up. Uh, And like you said, the Eagles are another one. Uh, So those are the teams I've heard the most about as potential trade up uh, kind of kind of candidates. You think Buffalo will stay pat where they are because of the depth of the wide receivers in this draft and the, and the depth of this class, or do you think they may look to move up a little bit because we all know with Gabe Davis in Jacksonville and uh, with Diggs now in Houston, they certainly have a huge void a la the Chargers. Yeah, that's it. I'm, I'm happy you mentioned that because I reported it a few days ago and the sleep deprivation got to me there. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, the Bills, I've heard, are definitely interested in moving up. I heard that from an assistant GM a few days ago, and they are looking to move up to get a receiver. Um, Brian Thomas Jr. sounds like he's the first choice, and Xavier Worthy is the second choice. Um, but they definitely feel the urge to move up to make sure they come away with one of those guys is what he said. From a player perspective, Charlie, anyone here that is either moving up boards late, moving down boards late because of maybe injury concerns or, or just guys that you're hearing a lot more buzz on now as we close in on a day before the draft? Well, I think uh, Leatu Latu, the defensive end from UCLA, uh, has moved up big time over the last couple of weeks because teams have gotten their medical reports back uh, from the from the combine medical and everything like that. And a lot of teams were kind of anticipating potentially, uh, uh, you know, thumbs down on him, ended up getting a thumbs up from their mm-hmm. team doctors. So that is a huge, huge, uh, you know, boom for him. Uh, with coming off that neck injury from uh, quite a few years ago now. And obviously it wasn't a problem for him at UCLA. So with that kind of uh, behind him, I think he could crack the top 10, could be the first defensive player off the board. Um, He has excellent tape. He's bigger than Dallas Turner and Jared Verse. So he has more size, more production than those guys. Uh, and they're, they're all good prospects, don't get me wrong, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if he's the first defensive player drafted on Thursday night. Anyone sliding that you've heard? Well, uh, to Bondre Sweat, you know, every year we have one. <laughs> seems to get in trouble in the weeks before the draft, uh, but I know some teams that had removed him from their boards uh, Michael Hall Jr. from Ohio State, the defensive tackle, and Jermaine Burton, uh, the wide receiver from Alabama. Both of those guys were dropped off some teams' boards for wow. character concerns. Uh, so uh, that definitely is a blow for the, if those guys slide. Um, that's probably going to be the the primary reason. Is just a lot of teams didn't want to draft them because of character. Um, so those are the sliders right now. Final one for me, Charlie. What are you hearing about what the Giants might do at six? I think it's going to be Malik Neighbors, the wide receiver from LSU. I think the the only way that it wouldn't be Neighbors is if he's off the board. Uh, um, I think that, you know, Drake May goes three, takes away that quarterback option for New York, and then at four, I think the Vikings trade in and get J.J. McCarthy. At five, I think the Chargers would take either Harrison or Joe Alt. And then I think Neighbors falls into the Giants' lap. I think that's the most likely outcome. I think Neighbors is plan A, uh, and I think uh, Marvin Harrison could be plan B. Not, and, and that's not a bad plan B, by the way, just just for the record. Charlie, good, <laughs> no. uh, good stuff, my friend. Tell the folks where they can find your work. 
You can find me at WalterFootball.com. I got my seven-round mock draft up. We have draft props. We have big boards, scouting reports, position rankings, all kinds of great stuff. And you can follow me on uh, X at Draft Campbell. Charlie, good stuff, my friend. Thank you. Enjoy the draft. Enjoy the draft, guys. Great talking with you. Charlie Campbell from Walter Football. Let's get back to the phones. And, Bob, that's some of the same stuff we're hearing. Um, but I, I thought the stuff that was interesting about the, maybe the Jets and Bears trying to move down, especially the Jets, who a lot of people really think are going to try to target Bowers here. So I'm curious to see how that, you know, a lot of people think all the action is going to be at, you know, four and five. Maybe there'll be more action between eight and ten than maybe some people think. Well, one of the questions, too, like with the, you know, with the Jets is <clears throat> they have two tackles that they brought in, albeit guys with injury. Especially Tyron Smith. <clears throat> Do you want to use that 10th overall pick to bring in an offensive lineman who you're going to need probably during the course of this season but moving forward? Or do you bring in a player like a Brock Bowers who's going to help you immensely? Yeah. And with Brees Hall and with the wide receivers that you have, I mean, it seems pretty natural. If your line can keep Aaron Rodgers upright, <laughs> which is – which they were not able to do last year, obviously, whether it was Aaron Rodgers or whatever other uh, quarterback they happen to have in there with their issues in the offensive line. All right, guys, we got 15 minutes left in the show. Let's take your calls the rest of the way at 201-939-4513. Wilson's in Roxbury. Wilson, I'm going to shut up here. We talk all the time. I'll give you a chance to talk to Bob. What's up, pal? Yeah, yeah. Hey, Johnny, how are you? Good. Hey, Bob, man, I'm a, I'm a big fan. I drive Johnny crazy every week, so I think I'll drive you crazy <laughs> Okay. Today. Let's do it. <laughs> no, listen, I, I asked Johnny this question. I want to ask you this question. Uh, to me, if the Giants draft a quarterback with a six overall pick, to me, it's a mistake. It's a mistake. I think we have a quarterback. I think he hasn't had a shot. When he, get, when he had a shot, he won 10 games with basically nothing. But everybody wants to run him out of town. And hey, every, every, you know, everybody has their own progress. But, but if the Giants do draft a quarterback, I told Johnny this. I'm going to tell you this. I, as, as much as I love Daniel, I don't want to see Daniel take another snap again. Though. All right? You draft the quarterback with a six-year-old pick. I, uh, Johnny, you told me maybe half the season. No. Uh, you guys start first. I want him first team reps. I want him starting first. Heck, I want him first on the line when he gets the food in the cafeteria. Okay? I mean, you know what I mean? Uh, I, 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 because what about Daniel starts five and three? You, what, are you going to yank him? It, it's kind of productive. To me, it's either you draft the quarterback, the six-year-old pick, he's got to play from day one, and then, you know, ship Daniel to Miami and get a third-round pick. I mean, he's better than Tua anyway. What do you think, Bob? Well, first of all, you do uh, realize, right, like the Giants made a massive trade with the Chargers and Eli didn't start until game 10? I know, Bob. Listen, I've heard that. Well, know, well do you realize that? I don't want to. Do, do, do you realize Patrick Mahomes' first start as a rookie came in the last game of the season after the Chiefs had had their playoff positioning locked up? I, I know, Bob. But listen, uh, Kurt Warner was was basically on his last legs, you know. And Daniel Jones is 20. On his last old. legs, he, he went up to the Super Bowl. He took the Cardinals to the Super Bowl four years later. <laughs> But that's right. Well, you know what I mean. It was old. It was old. It was old. But all right. So listen, I'm just frustrated. I told Johnny this, Bobby. I'm just frustrated. I don't want to turn the clock back again. I, that's what I told Johnny, and and I'm telling you the same well, thing. Well, if, if if you draft a quarterback at thank six, you, Wilson. Appreciate the call, pal. If you draft a quarterback at six, you're not turning the clock back at all. That's what I tried to explain to him. All you're doing is giving the player an opportunity to get reps in training camp to observe, to soak it in, to understand the speed of what's happening, not only on the field, but in the meetings on the practice field, and kind of get up to speed. And then at some point, you're going to integrate them into the lineup. Like I, I always felt that uh, two regimes ago, I thought they pulled the plug on Eli Manning too fast. Now, Daniel Jones' first game in Tampa turned out turned out good, but I still think that they pulled the plug on Eli too fast. They benched him after two games. He had nothing to do with those two games not being successful. Um, but you're not turning the clock back if you bring in a quarterback at number six and he doesn't start from day one. No, I agree, Bob. You're bring, the reason you bring in a quarterback is because you think in the, in the long term that he has a chance to be something special, right? And, and that's why you're making that move. And 
that doesn't mean bringing in Brian Burns was a mistake because you want to put that quarterback in the best possible ecosystem. Just because you get a rookie quarterback doesn't mean you, oh, well, now we got to tear everything else down and build again from scratch. No, you insert them into the ecosystem you're trying to build already, and you hope the end result will be better. So uh, I'm with you. I, I think and if Daniel Jones plays and plays well, you just created an opportunity to potentially trade him and get something for him. That's the other thing I said to Wilson, Bob. It's almost like you listened to the show last I did week. Not, I did not I listen last week. That, I'll be honest with you. Word for word, what I said for to, exactly the same thing I said to Wilson. Wilson, I swear to you, Bob and I did not talk about that before the show. But 100%, I'm with you, Bob. Let's go to Robert in Chicago. He's up next on Big Blue Kickoff Live. What's up, Robert? Hey, John and Bob. Um, I just got to make two points, and then I'll take it off the air. Yep. All right. Uh, well, my first one is a question. So I just want to hear what your guys' old Giants players as a, the comp for the three rookie re- wide receivers. So, like, Plexico Burris, the Aduniers is what I'm getting to. I got you. I got you. And then the second thing, would with that interview with Bucky, John, um, I don't agree what he was saying about the rookie quarterback statement. Same Matt Ryan was like the last legitimate rookie quarterback to make the playoffs. Like in the past decade, decade besides C.J. Stroud, there's been Brock, Mac Jones, Lamar Jackson, Dak, Jimmy G, Kirk Cousins, Russell, Andrew Luck. I'm sorry, Russell Wilson, Andrew Luck, and RG3. And then I fall off with uh, Andy Dalton being the last. So, I mean, there's in the right system, like you guys were saying, these quarterbacks can excel. Not saying that these this year's quarterbacks are it, and I hope we do grab a wide receiver instead of quarterback because I, all honesty, I think we'll be having a high draft pick next year too. So we can possibly run through the same scenario that we're talking now next year. And um, great show. Thank you guys, and uh, enjoy your day. Thank you, Robert. And I don't remember Bucky saying that specifically, but, yeah, you're right. If you put the right rookie quarterback in the right situation, they can do it. And listen, neighbors, and I don't study these players like you do. Um, I'm more focused on the NFL players in the NFL game. But, I mean, Malik Neighbors has some Odell in him. Oh, it's a lot of Odell. Right? He's got some Odell in him. Oh, I remember wow. I remember Troy Aikman saying that uh, Odell in that class was the best route runner of all the receivers in that draft coming out. And that's before Odell became Odell, mm-hmm. when he was Odell Beckham Jr. and not Odell. Um, so, because he, he was asking for comparisons. And I would put, I think Burris or Dunze isn't bad either. You know, both guys can run, they can separate, they're big, they can make physical. contested catches, physical, yeah. And honestly, I don't know if I have one for Marvin Harrison Jr. Because that guy is just so different with the way he moves at that size. He's a six four three guy that runs like a guy that's 5'11 and changes direction like a 5'11 guy. There are many guys in the league that can move like that at that size. So I'm not sure I have a good Giants comp for Harrison Jr. necessarily. Yeah, he's going to be a stud. Regardless. Yeah, he really is. He's going to be an unbelievable player. But good, good good, call. Good question. We have some open lines, guys, if you want. 201-939-4513. Dan in Brooklyn's up next. Hey, Dan. Hey, guys. What's going on? What's on, Dan? What's up, Dan? Pretty good. Um, just a few uh, things uh, about the draft and sure. quarterback. Um, this one is mainly for anybody still in the Daniel Jones uh, fan club. We, listen, we have not done everything right by him. I'll, I'll be the first to admit that. But we didn't just spend this whole off season traveling the country scouting quarterbacks for fun. We are very much actively looking to replace him, as we should. Um, for anybody saying that we need to, you know, build this team up before we take a quarterback, a rookie quarterback is going to get killed... Um, I would like to see what they thought of the Texas team last offseason when C.J. Stroud was taken. And I would love to get their opinion on just very obviously what having a good rookie quarterback can do for a franchise. Okay. Last year, the Texans were were bottom-of-the-barrel team. They'd take one player. Well, two players. Well, to be special. Well, t- two, two right, players. Right, right. But, Will Anderson was pretty good, but, too. But... Yes, but the reason that they are where they are now and the reason they traded for Diggs and Joe Mixon and Daniel Hunter, his name is C.J. Stroud. No, that's fair. Yeah, I got that. And 
You bet you don't. You, you, like that. you you don't take a quarterback at six just for the sake of taking a quarterback. Agreed. Agreed. It's, it's got to be the. Guy. It's got to be the him. guy that yeah. they have outside of Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels, who they're not going to get a shot at. These other guys, how do they feel about them? And Dan, you're right. Clearly, they have interested. They had interest in investigating the players, right? That's why you do all this work right. on them. The question is that what right. was their conclusion once they did all the investigating, which none of us had the answer to. It's upstairs. Correct. It's like right above us. Right. Upstairs. And, I guess, and the bigger point is just the the days of Daniel Jones as a starting quarterback for the New York Giants. I think, unless something goes very much wrong, are over. Um, and then yeah, but, but, but Dan, that, that's that. the problem. Okay. What happens What happens if you don't have access to the guys that you think are really good? Remember, you're, you're not picking third here. If the Giants are in the Patriots spot, I would understand your point. But picking at six, you don't know if you're going to get access but, to the guy that you like. You know what I'm saying? Qu- quarterback or not, if, you got, if I told you guys that for the 24 season, let's say we don't draft a quarterback, if I told you that Drew Locke started the entire season, would you call me crazy? Yes, I would. I, I, if, if Daniel Jones is healthy, he's starting Week One. Period. Stop. Okay. Okay. You don't think you don't think there's going to be a "quote unquote" competition during camp? I do not, Bob. Well, I mean, I think okay. there'll be a competition just to see with Jones coming off his injury. I think there'll be a level of competition to see can Jones do the things that he did prior to the knee injury, and if he can't. Well, yeah, it, they may opt in a different. They they could go the other way, but Daniel Jones is probably going to be the starting quarterback for the Giants this year. If it's injury related, yes, I understand your point on that. Fair. Um, and then I mean, if, because remember yeah. this: you, as a fan, may love one of you one or two of these quarterbacks, and clearly Chicago loves Caleb Williams. And you gave me the C.J. Stroud example, but had Bryce Young look. Baker Mayfield, who was the first overall pick, is now on his fourth team. Sam Darnold, who was the number two overall pick, and in the year Sam Darnold came out, he was being talked about in the same way that people are talking about Drake May and Jaden Daniels and all these other guys. In fact, he was projected to pay me go number one. There's actually a lot of Darnold-May similarities with the way they were scouted and talked about. The Jets may have reached for Zach Wilson with the number two overall pick, but there were a lot of other teams that had Zach Wilson in the top ten as as a draft pick for a quarterback. Chris Sims did his quarterback rankings. He had Zach Wilson ahead of Trevor Lawrence. So, oh it, yeah, that's fair. It, it, I, I it, guess I'm just of the opinion that unless you have a top ten ish quarterback, you need to be taking swings until you get one of those. Oh no, and and, and then that's fair. Um, that and that is absolutely fair. Totally understand where you're coming from on that. What's your second point? And then. Uh, Two last points, and I'll, I can take these off the air. Sure. I wonder if there is a situation where we can kind of have our cake and eat it too with maybe like a, a Dunze at six, and then somebody mentioned earlier uh, the show that maybe trading back up into the first for like a Penix or something. Um, even if it means trading a future first, I think – as a plan B, C, D, that wouldn't be too bad just because... If, you, if, you fe- if, if you felt that strongly about Michael Penix, if in their evaluations they had him as the second or third best quarterback in the draft, you don't run. You can't run the risk of waiting to trade back into the back end of the second round. You almost round. have to pick him at six, You've got to right? pick him at six. Right. Which is why the Giants That's took fair. Daniel Jones at six. And if you don't think that highly of him, you're not going to trade up to pick him at all. When the Giants selected That's Daniel fair. Jones at six, people said, why didn't they wait until 17 when Dexter Lawrence was selected? And I have heard through many of my sources from around the league, there were a lot of other teams interested in Daniel Jones, and it was expressed to me pretty clearly that Daniel Jones would have never been there at 17. I, you would not have had your cake and eaten it too. Mm-hmm. That's fair. And then, John, last question for you. I know this is a Giants draft show, but I, I, I can't wrap my head around this. Okay. Nick, um, why isn't uh, I, was, OG I was hoping he was going to ask Maxie, a Ranger question. Why isn't OG on Maxi the whole entire game? Yeah. And, uh, uh, I'll take that off. No, good, good point, Dad. I'll be really quick here. I, 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 going into the series, I didn't want to put him on Maxi either. I think 
as a defender, his biggest weakness is guarding really sh- small and quick guys. So I, I did not quite get that either. I would like to see DiVincenzo on him, and if not him, then then McBride. So I, I'm with you. That's are one th- adjustment I would make. Are the Knicks it, up quick. two games to nothing? They are, yes. Okay, then for- yes. But I, f- funny enough, they've actually kind of been outplayed for two games, but they figured out how to win both of them. That's it's what good weird. teams do. That's what good teams do. They've stolen two games that they probably shouldn't have won. So let's go Knicks and let's go Rangers. We've got a couple of big playoff games coming the next couple of days. Absolutely. Fortunately, game three of the Knicks will be 7.30 on Thursday night while the draft's going on. So that might be a rough goal for, 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 for me over here. But anyway, uh, Cliff in New York will wrap us up today. Cliff, you're on with Schmelk and Papa. How are you, pal? Hey, guys. Thanks for the call. Um, I'm... Uh... I'm, I'm thinking we're forgetting how much improved we were on offense the last seven games the last year. Uh, I was feeling really good about the team those last seven games. I thought we were back as a wild card contender. The offense, uh, in five of those games, the offense scored 24 or more and, 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 and against uh, three playoff teams. And in the two stinker games, uh, they, they, the defenses were really good, and that leads me up to this thing about the wide receiver. Yeah, no, Cliff, I just want you to relax for a second. The Eagles were a shell of a franchise at that point. So, yes, they scored well, more than 23 against the Eagles. What did the Eagles do in the playoffs? They got shellacked. Well, well we, we looked a lot better on offense. The, we, had seven, we had five guys that started uh, every game together the last seven games. Except for the last game when we put two, we had actually enough depth to put two guys in that played well and the uh, on the right any, side in the last game. Either, but yes, okay. But what I'm getting at, what I'm getting at is to be able to take advantage of the elite wide wide receiver and the difference they make from the guys that are just very good. I think we have to be better in the middle of the offensive line first, and there's just no quick fix for that. We don't have the elite guard or the very good guard yet. We might have it in a Zudu. I hope we can find them in this draft. Well, Cliff, 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 hold on. I mean, you didn't even mention John Runyon Jr., the guy they just paid pretty good money to in for agency. I think that's the that's, guy you hope it's going to be. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think he's the kind of guy that gets us up with the kind of offensive lines that the elite teams have to go against the best defenses and still have time to throw the ball down the field to their elite wideout. I think that's going to take a year or two okay. to get to that. So, okay, so what's your larger point then in terms of what they should do in the draft? Well, if we, uh, I think the, the, the position in the draft every year that is least romantic and exciting to me is one of the most important positions on the team, and it's cornerback. And, and uh, I'm never thrilled when we get a cornerback. It's like, well, who needs him? Well, if you want to win, you need him. And it's a premium position and all that stuff. With, you have to be able to plan to pay him. So if we trade down, uh, we can get and, – and there's one of those elite corners, you said there's five of them, uh, and we can get that guy, that would be great. And what's wrong with Bowers? You know, I mean, if we can not lose out on him, that would be a big, big inc- you know, change in, in the offense. And I can, I can wait for this super-duper wide out at least a little longer because I just don't think as much as you need to throw the ball down the field – you want to be able to do that when Daniel comes up to the line of scrimmage and he sees the opportunity. He's got to have the confidence. He's going to have the time to do it at that time. And and the only way you do that is consistent play in the middle. And I just don't think – I think we can look forward to good, steady play and being competitive and being a wild card contender the way things stand right now. So you want to pick whatever, a guard then in the, on day two, Cliff? You keep talking about the guards, but then you're not mentioning picking any guards in the draft. <laughs> No, I, I do, I do. I'm just okay, they, I got you. they they use the three they use the three on Izudu, and I hope he can still do it. But I think they have to try another shot like Izudu, absolutely. And and uh, and if and the, and if trading down gives them the capital they need to move around to get the guy they want, that that's what I'm looking for. And then I'm counting on Schmitz to be. Uh, as as good as uh, people think he is. I think he's. I think he's going to be Thanks, much. Im- I think he's going to be a lot better this year, Schmitz. Um, Someone that I trust that understands O line play says you get him. He got a lot of snaps. He got a lot of reps. He got a lot of experience, uh, and you put him in an off season program as a pro for the first time with that intelligence, and you marry him with a good offensive line coach. That he's got a lot more upside. Um, hey, look, if they trade back a couple spots, maybe they get they wind up getting another second round pick. You could still get a stud wide receiver in the second round. The yeah. the Hall of Fame is loaded. And the Pro Bowl every year is loaded with wide receivers playing in the Pro Bowl that did not get drafted in the first round. 
Just look at what the Rams throw out there. When were those guys taken? Puka and, and Cooper. Yeah, I mean, and there and you can go through the list of guys that have been tremendous receivers that are second round picks, and especially with the quarterbacks going early, there's going to be guys that are back end first round picks that are going to get pushed into the second round if five or even six quarterbacks go in round one. All right, Bob. We're at the end of our journey here. Uh, final thoughts. I'm not going to ask you for a prediction per se, but just final thoughts before the Giants start drafting their players in the 2024 draft in just over 24 hours. Well, I think it's it's very obvious. I mean, the Giants have some very glaring needs. Um, when you look at their roster as it's constitu- constituted right now, they need a frontline receiver. They need a receiver that teams are going to fear. It doesn't mean that they have to take that guy at six. Because as I said, there's been plenty of players that get drafted late in the first round or later in the first round. Odell was not a top ten pick. Odell did Odell did things in his first twelve games in his rookie year that shattered rookie records. He was not taken in the top ten. So you can find a guy. They have to get a corner. They need a safety. And I would never be adverse to drafting another offensive lineman in there somewhere. Pretty obvious, and they're gonna. Need, they need a tight end. I wouldn't mind adding a running back either, to be honest. With well, you, you can. Well, you're gonna be able to get a running back in the fourth round or fifth round. Oh yeah, day three for sure for running back. Yeah. Absolutely. And so you'll you'll be able to find one there, unless the value is such that when a player comes up, whether it's a quorum or one of those guys, because I think one running back, I think the Texas running back will be the only one that potentially goes in the first round. I think he'll be. I think Dallas. So I think he'll be. I think he'll be the first running back off the board to the Cowboys in round two. That'll be my guess. Round two. I'm saying he's going to go in round one. Wow, you're on That's the my ch- prediction. You're on, you're on the Chad Ryder uh, train there, huh? Yeah, I'm on the Chad Ryder. That's my man. <laughs> and he did have his surgery done by the Cowboys doctors. He did, so he knows everything about. It. That's absolutely which true. why he didn't go to hospital for special surgery blows me away. Is it is the best uh Orthopedic uh, hospital in the country. No question about it. Bob, appreciate the time, my friend. This was fun. All right. Enjoy the coverage. And uh, obviously, Giants.com, all the social media platforms will have complete comprehensive coverage of the 2024 NFL Draft. Absolutely. We have one more Big Blue Kickoff Live tomorrow at 1230. No guests, just your calls. We'll take your predictions on what you think the Giants will do in the draft. Matt Sytak and I uh, will go through all of that. Um, I'll go through my final rankings and board as well. We'll have fun with that. You can make fun of me when I'm really wrong after the draft, which will be great. Um, and then, of course, we have live coverage of the draft at night. We'll come on when the Giants make their pick at 6 or wherever they might end up selecting if they trade up or down. And then we'll have coverage on Friday night uh, when the Giants get on the clock to pick in round two. And then we'll start at noon on Saturday as well for our special Giants draft show right here on Giants.com, the Giants mobile app, Giants YouTube channel. Make sure you check it out. And don't forget, folks, Giants tickets. Go to Giants.com slash tickets. Become a season ticket member. And to check out all of our content, download Giants TV, the Giants digital TV streaming app. It's free on all of your TV, uh, smart TVs, uh, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, all those great platforms. For Bob, I'm John. We'll see you next time on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hey, guys. Back at the playground again, huh? Yep. You know what this playground could use? A wine country. Heck, yeah. And some waves. So we could go surfing. Oh, <laughs> ah, love that. A redwood forest would be cool. I'm in. Ah, ski slopes. Let's do it. Um, can a girl go shopping? Yeah, baby. Wait. Did we just invent California? Discover why California is the ultimate playground at visitcalifornia.com. You've probably heard a lot about electrified vehicles lately. Well, Toyota has electrified options for every lifestyle. We've got hybrids, no plug needed. But we also have plug-in hybrids, if that's your thing. (laughs) You can even go 100% electric in the Toyota BZ4X. With so many options for reducing carbon emissions... Toyota is electrified, diversified. Oh, oh, oh. Learn more about our Beyond Zero vision for the future at toyota.com slash beyond zero.